from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicholas Brown. I am a music specialist and concert producer here at the Library of Congress. And outside of the library, I wear a hat, uh, which is called, I'm the founder and music director of the Irving Fine Society, which was founded back in 2006 at Brandeis University. And the purpose of the society is to celebrate, promote, and educate all about Irving Fine and his colleagues in the American Neoclassical School. Uh, there are several folks here in the audience who have been with me since the beginning of the project of the Irving Fine Society, including several of you who I see who used to perform with us, which is really exciting. Um, the, the folks up here on stage are kind of the people who I bow down to in terms of they're the ones that have been uh, preserving the legacy uh, for many, many years. And it's, uh, it's a great privilege to be up, there, up here with them. And uh, their, their work is a continuation of uh, Verna Fine's work. Verna was Irving's uh, dear wife. And she's responsible for bringing the fine collection here to the library, along with uh, Rosalie, who is here to my left. Rosalie is an arts consultant and a fabulous friend of the fine family, and now my friend as well, which is great. And uh, she's going to talk to us a lot about um, how the fine collection came to be, what Verna used to do in terms of promoting the music, and uh, uh, also where we're going nowadays with the fine legacy. And to Rosalie's left is Joanna Fine looking very stylish today with her turquoises and purples. Uh, Joanna is uh, Irving's third daughter. And to the left of Joanna is Emily. Emily is the middle daughter, and she is sitting right in the middle. How about that? Uh, and then all the way on the end is Claudia Fine, who is Irving's first daughter. And I'm going to let all of them introduce themselves a little bit, because I think it would be great if everyone could hear what your professional backgrounds are, and if you still are into music professionally or otherwise. So. As the first, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so I am in the healthcare field, and I work for Humana, a large insurance company, doing basically helping to keep people safe at home and not in hospitals. Um, and I'm probably as passionate about that as my father was about what he did. Uh, I was not the uh, the musical genius that my sisters were. I did not, I did play a piano and I did play the clarinet, but really, you know, under duress. And I dropped it uh, as soon as I got away from home. Uh, but it didn't, pa it skipped my generation and all three of my children are, were in the arts, which I'm incredibly pleased about. And, uh, you know, I look forward to sharing the memories that I do have of what life was like with my parents. I died when he was 14 years old. She died. She died. Hey, they, he died. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit of me died then. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Anyway, so he died when I was 14 years old, and I do remember, you know, some. Um, some is colored by, uh, you know, pictures and conversations that happened since, but uh, I'm happy to share that with you. I'm Emily, this one, um, middle child, and um, I, my day job is um, gynecology. I went into the health field as well, women's health, um, but I really toyed with becoming a full-time musician, and still to this day, uh, it's a huge part of my life. I um, studied the piano with Joel, is he here? Up there. Um, and <laughs> loved study, he was the best, and I'm so happy that he's here today. Um, and then, sadly, my, when, after my father died, I actually took up the French horn, inspired by one of my older sister's oldest friends who showed up today, and I fell in love with the horn. Little did I know that my father wrote beautifully for the horn. Sadly, he never knew that I actually could play that music. But I pursued it very seriously, um, majored in music, and then sort of had a wake-up day where I said, Ugh, 
this, this is really going to be a hard life for me. And I was also obsessed with the human body, another, I don't even know if they're related, but somehow I thought they were. And uh, I pursued medicine. Um, and never really stopped playing the French horn, a little bit of hiatus for having to pursue the career and having a successful marriage and three great kids. Um, but came back to it really strongly and taught French horn for about 18 years at the Neighborhood Music School in New Haven, which is where I live. Played actually in the New Haven Symphony for a while. And now my music playing is pretty much woodwind quintet and chamber music. And what I will say, just because I'm really proud of it, I worked really hard this year to do an Irving Fine Centennial concert. And we had an audience of over 200 people. Um, my quintet played both the partita and the romanza two amazing pieces. He is like central to the wooden quintet literature. And we also had a fabulous pianist play the music for piano, the diversions, and we had a singer sing childhood fables for grown-ups, and it was just an awesome experience. And um, I did it because I love his music. I think it's really special. I love the word that Joel used, integrity. What I love is that um, his music touches so much, it's both quote, neoclassical, but also lyrical, it's humorous, it's serious, it's sad, it's agitated, it's, it's really important, I agree with Nick, and I was just thrilled to do it, and I'm thrilled that the Library of Congress is doing this, and I'm thrilled that you're all here. I'm Joanna, um, otherwise known as Jojo, um, and I'm the third. Um, I uh, was eight years old when my father died, um, but I do have quite a bit of memories about him, along with overlays of stories. Um, I was uh, very drawn to music and also drawn to watching my father compose. So, and my relationship with my father, um, I remember it being very, very close. He was also particularly fascinated with the fact that I had perfect pitch and, you know, and was always testing that and things like that. And I used to sit underneath the piano and while he would compose and feel the vibrations and all that. I think there's stuff that I wrote that's in the program that says this stuff. Anyway, I am the third daughter and the third person in healthcare. Um, and there are probably multiple, multiple reasons why. Um, we had a father whom we di you know, whom died very young and also my mother had a lot of chronic um, problems, ulcerative colitis and was sick a lot. So I think those things probably influenced all of us, but they certainly influenced me. Um, I'm a pianist and a vocalist and also an oboe player. And, uh, but my father didn't get to know that I was an oboe player. I actually took up the oboe after he died, influenced by his symphony. There's a really gorgeous English horn solo. So that's what influenced me. And um, I was sort of headed towards being a musician um, studied with Joel, um, studied at a, a music camp, I don't know whether people know, a Greenwood music camp up in Cummington, and then also at Aspen, and I studied with, uh, my first oboe teacher was actually Ralph Gomberg, and then students of Ralph Gomberg, and then Ronnie Roseman of the New York Rudin Quintet, who was, the, that was the quintet that first played the partita, right? Oh, and the romanza, romanza, and the romanza here, right after Dad died. So Ronnie was an incredible teacher and an incredible composer, too. Um, but I decided not to go into that route um, and went um, to California, University of California, Santa Cruz, where um, one of my father's colleagues from Harvard was the head of the department. And so I did oboe out in University of California, Santa Cruz, studied with Mark Lifshe in the San Francisco Symphony, and sang in the choir, and played in the orchestra, but then ended up going into psychology and theater, which is now in the next generation. My, um, my nephew Isaac is into theater, and um, so that's being passed on in that direction. But ultimately what happened is I ended up going into the mental health field, which it turns out my mother kind of informed me later on in my life that dad, if he had not uh, been a composer, he might have been a psychiatrist. So that's the field that I'm in. I'm an adult adolescent and child psychiatrist. But I have to say that my heart really still very much is in music. I think I perceive and feel the world through music all the time. 
and it's just sort of second nature to me. And I'm really, really happy about the centennial and the way it's going. Rosalie, you're up. I'm Rosalie Calabrese. Uh, I call myself a management consultant for the arts because I do work with people in all the arts, anyone who comes to me for some help. And uh, in that regard, maybe I'm in the healthcare business also. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, <laughs> I, uh, I started out in um, theater. I'm also a writer. Uh, at the time that I'm going to talk about, um, I was involved in, in writing and uh, producing for theater. Um, I write books and lyrics for musicals, or I have done. And uh, I needed a, a day job because uh, the theater business doesn't pay very much for unknowns. And so uh, I managed to get a job with an organization called American Composers Alliance. Now, I had studied piano for a short time, popular pop stuff. Um, I studied the violin for a week and a half, and the <laughs> guitar, and I never learned anything about music. I did try to read Walter Piston's book at one time, but it went right by me. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm a non-musician, non but uh, of course I love music. Uh, so I got this job with American Composers Alliance and uh, worked there for 32 years. I finally became the executive director. Uh, and during that time, uh, ACA, as it was known, uh, shared offices with composers' recordings. And Verna Fine worked for composers' recordings. And so uh, we saw each other in the office all the time and uh, finally started to uh, go to lunch together and we became pretty good friends. And Verna was the um, direct male uh, person uh, for CRI and they decided to eliminate that uh, function uh, because computers were taking over uh, the, the idea of direct mail. And uh, so Verna was let go, and she was let go in a, a rather roughshod way, and she was very angry uh, as she was storming toward the, the door to leave. And um, I looked up from my desk. I, I knew what was going on, and I ran after her, and I said, come work for me. Well, she couldn't work for ACA, but um, due to other changes in the music business, uh, I was uh, offered the opportunity by ACA to start my own uh, business consulting uh, during my day uh, at 170 West 74th Street, which is where we worked. And so, and so I had a little clientele um, of my own, and that's what Verna came to work with, with me for. And um, it didn't have a name. <laughs> I was just helping people who came through the door and wanted more than ACA was uh, offering at the time. And uh, it, it grew. We got more and more people. And uh, eventually, uh, I was let go from ACA. <laughs> and so we picked ourselves up. And my son had just gotten married. And so I had this extra room. It had a bed in it, but I got rid of the bed, brought in another um, desk. and another computer, and got a two-line telephone, and we went to work in my apartment. And I still work there. Um, and I think I'll stop with that, because we'll be talking about the rest of it on the panel. 
So I think uh, because we have a short amount of time, I'd love to first cover some memories of your parents um, and also Rosalie's memories of, of both of them and then segue into what the different stages have been of promoting uh, Irving's legacy and then also what we need to do still in the future and what we can have everyone in the audience do in the future. Um, so can we start off with maybe sharing some memories of your father and your parents together and um, the people in their, their world like Copeland and, and Lenny and such and Harold? Well, I have a very vivid memory of actually being brought up in the summers of Tanglewood and it was kind of like an overgrown summer camp in a way. You know, some we had um, a, you know, a housekeeper person that was a dear friend of our family who would come up for the summer and cook for Aaron and Lucas and you know everybody would come and eat dinner at you know and my mother was sort of like you know you know master of that mistress of the house you know I mean she ran everything and as she did her whole life I mean she was very much an organizer an administrator a get it done girl and um, and people loved that they counted on her to kind of like pick up the pieces that they couldn't pick up because they were busy, you know, being composing and thinking about cerebrally, and she was being very practical. Um, so I remember that. I remember picking blueberries there and raspberries, and we would all make jam together. Um, I have great memories of my father's humor. Um, he was an extremely funny guy. Uh, a real tease, he used to drive, he used to tease me a lot. Um, my son Isaac has that same look that I hate. It's that, <laughs> that look in the eye that I know, I know you're not really telling me the truth. And that was my father's look. Um, he also, you know, had a real kind of potty mouth. You know, he used to like joke about, you know, all kinds of things like, <laughs> You know, he would pretend he had vomited and then call me in and throw a piece of plastic vomit yeah, on the floor. And I mean, he was a really fun guy. Um, <laughs> he was. And he, um, he loved to cook. And we had lots of food in our house. I think uh, he got that from his parents. His father his was, well, his mother and his father, his father who used to it. make herring, pickled herring, which actually Joel Spiegelman would eat every Friday after our piano lessons. Um, you know, I actually, uh, you know, just remember my father was the one who would get up early in the morning and actually make us breakfast um, because he didn't have to go to work. He didn't sleep either. <laughs> and my mother liked to sleep in. And, uh, you know, he was... Um, you know, it was nice having a father that was at home a lot. Um, you know, I just today, three of my high school friends are here. And I think probably I blocked out a lot of my childhood memories after he died. Um, but they were telling me, one in particular, Janice, said that she remembered that everybody, like we were probably preteens at that point, hanging out in my house and my father called me out of the little group and said, come into the study, get your clarinet. And I did, and he was playing something on the piano and he wanted me to play something on the clarinet. So, I mean, I have zero memory of that, but if she remembers it, it's probably true. Uh, you know, we had cocktail parties, you know, my parents would make us all like we were uh, all like waitresses ass and assistants. I, I actually knew how to make the martinis with with the vermouth on the side and then the 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 little you know, I used to sneak the little onions and I'd eat them myself, but then you know you put the onions in and then or some people liked it with the olives. There's also one other thing that just, I mean, talking actually makes me remember. It's interesting. Thank you for being my therapist, everybody. Uh, I also remember that my father was slightly allergic to chocolate. Slightly? He sneezed. Yeah, exactly. And for some reason, because of these parties, they always had petty fours. Oh, I don't know yeah. whatever happened to petty fours, but there was always this, these boxes of petty fours on the side. Remember those? Yeah, with the little like, red with the doors there. And 
my mother, my father would like break out into like sneezing and my mother would go, Irving, are you, are you cheating again and eating that chocolate? You know? So uh, those were some of the fun things that used to take place. Emily, you have any? Ooh, um, I need more therapy. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm really pretty blocked before the age of 10. I have some memories. So much of it, I don't know whether it's from reading articles, talking to friends. Um, I have a couple of really special memories. Uh, I remember being really frustrated trying to learn a Bach two-part invention and having my father who had perfect pitch and I did not scream the pitches from the other room when I would hit a wrong note. And then, as he always was, was so sweet, would come in and say, you know, maybe you should take a break from Bach. And he bought me like the little versions of Broadway musical Easies. And so for a couple of weeks, I would do like Do Re Mi or um, what's the one that ran for hundreds of years? No, my, not My Fair Lady, the um, Fantastic. Soon It's Gonna Rain. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And, um, and just feeling like that he was so tolerant and so inclusive and just a very, very nurturing, loving, loving father. Um, I also remember um, very much going to Symphony Hall, and I, I hope I'm right, you probably, when they played the diversions. Mm -hmm. And I remember him bringing his three little girls, and he got a standing, you know, they recognized the composer, and then he let us stand up next to him. And it was like, oh, that's really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, other than that, there's just a lot of what my mother told me. She, she talked a lot about him. Um, the only, you know, the only thing that I would say is that she, although she moved on and she had a wonderful full life, thanks to Rosalie, thanks to a lot of people, she never let go of his music, thankfully, because I don't think we'd be here today. We would not be here. Um, but she was incredible about it. There was the Brandeis concert every year. There were always these concerts. And she would always say, do you want to come? And I know in her heart she wanted us all to come. But there was never this pressure that I impose on my children to come. <laughs> They're all here. <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm officially apologizing for being nudgy. Um, but I remember one memory in particular around the loss of him, which was about a month afterwards, I was practicing the piano because our lessons continued, right, Joel? after he died, and when I practiced the piano after he died, I had to put his picture down. And she came into the room and she s lifted them all up and she said, it's gonna hurt, but you're gonna thank me for pulling up these pictures, look at them, and hear him. And she was right. Um, well, I have a lot of similar memories, but from a different vantage point, because I was smaller and mostly on the floor. Um, <laughs> that's true, we're only 18 months apart. But, but I do remember like a lot of the parties where there was a lot of music and a lot of drinking and a lot of eating, a lot of salty food too. And um, I remember it because I was supposed to be in bed and I didn't go to bed. I, like my father, am not a great sleeper. So, um, so I do remember that in between the eating, people were up and playing the piano, and also it just blew my mind the way they could just improvise, and it sounded like they had composed it. You know, that was, and also we had two pianos, like here, you know, and so we had two pianos, one from each family, and, um, and there's a whole history about that too, but because, you know, dad, who was the pianist, his own family didn't really give him the piano. There was a lot of struggle about that. His father had a lot of issues with him. But anyway, in the middle of the party, people, there would be many, many hands on the piano. So you'd have, you know, whether it be Joel or Dick Wernick or Harold. Um, I also have memories a lot with Hannah Shapiro, who's here, um, going and hanging out with my dad and being with my friend Hannah. Pure. But anyway, um, and so dad would go and hang out with his buddies, you know, Harold and Esther, and I would hang out with my buddy. So there was a lot of my father in between. Uh, he just seemed to have an enormous amount of time 
He had a lot of energy, but he had a lot of time for people. And that brings me, seg you know, brings me in sort of into a segue about that I do remember visiting Brandeis and walking around the hallways and sort of sensing how much my father really enjoyed people and teaching. And he was just very, he was a very passionate guy. Um, he did have quite a sense of humor, though, it's true. Anyway, I feel very fortunate that I do remember a lot of things. Um, and it's really interesting, when I hear his voice, there's a thing you can get online, the WGBH. There's a really cool thing that you can Google. It's, I think, in 1950. With Bernstein and Copeland, right? Bernstein, interview, yeah. Bernstein Copeland, and Lucas. And they're talking about American music yeah. and, the, and the, whole, the whole business about, you know, that the Europeans didn't really feel that there really was American music. And then they talked about the influence of jazz and whether jazz really would, had influenced American music. And then there was, and they were talking while extemporaneously playing music at the same time. And it's just, well, it's sort of like these panels, only with a piano and with them probably eating and smoking at the same time. <laughs> heavy, heavy smoking, yeah. With a cigarette in his hand or mouth all the time. I didn't actually know Irving Fine. He, he died before I met Verna. So everything I knew about him was through Verna and for, through her memory bank, which was very clear. Um, she, she adored him, and she um, had enormous respect for his uh, compositions and and his musicianship altogether, and uh, as you've heard, uh, she worked very hard uh, to make make a career for him uh, post mortem, uh, almost. Um, and uh, so I I have enormous respect for her and her the memory of her and. Uh, I just loved working with her. She, she's a very special woman. Thank you. Uh, so now it would be great if we could talk about the different stages of the legacy and preserving it. Um, so there was the period of after he had died, and there was the memorial, the memorialization of him going on at concerts. Leonard Bernstein had a famous concert that was a radio broadcast where he opened the concert with a bit of a eulogy for Fine and then performed some of his music. Uh, and Copeland was heavily involved in, in supporting Verna throughout all that period. Uh, at what point did Verna kind of um, shift into the long-term attitude about the legacy rather than just that, you know, the initial shock of what had happened? Um, I think, you know, I think first of all she worked at Brandeis first. Yeah. Um, and so all you know, and she actually supported, it was, she worked for the, uh, the festival, the Creative Arts Festival, raising money and whatnot. Um, and so I think that's kind of when she started thinking in terms of like, sort of systematically focusing on, you know, doing this in a way that wasn't just, you know, I love, I want but really kind of getting the fact that, you know, she was gonna have to sell this, she was gonna have to be organized, you know, this was just not gonna happen. So I think that experience working at Brandeis really had an enormous impact. So that by the time, well, and then no, after and that York, she- Remember, she what? worked for Brandeis in New York. In New York, she was in New right. York. She yeah. was in New York. She was always and in New York. York. Yeah, her no, friends, they moved to New York. Remember her friends, Arthur and, I think Arthur and Lois had a big influence on helping her. And then she worked at Sarah Lawrence. Remember, she worked at Sarah Lawrence. Too. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to give like a detailed no, like okay. uh, chronology right now. No, but as we worked yeah. at Sarah Lawrence, she was an assistant dean. She was an assistant to the dean at Sarah Lawrence. And that helped her, I think, you know, develop probably more and more of her sense of academia and and giving her more a sense of... Well, you know, right from the get-go, mm -hmm. the, her, my father's parents, right from the beginning, my father's parents left a large sum of money in his name. They were being fine chair. Um, to, to Brandeis, and so there was a fund that was created, um, and there was, in his memory also, a professorship created, 
and the fund was responsible for creating at least one yearly concert in his name. So already there was at least some network. And so that we knew was happening. And, but then, and, then, and then they also promoted the, the sculpture in his name, remember? But that when, was, when did she make the decision? He, what, Nick should answer the question when, they decided, when she decided to leave his archives to the Library of Congress, because that really set a lot of other things in motion. And you were involved in that, Rosalind. Well, you know right. what? Betty is here. Right. Where's Betty? Yeah, where's Betty? Is it Hi, Betty. Betty, <laughs> Betty no, maybe you could but, clarify. But, she, cause but she's keep in mind, when my father died, my mother, for a year, was just in shock. And then she said, I got to do something. She had not really worked as a, other than supporting my father's music and paying bills and doing stuff for you know his friends a lot of the you know the musicians in 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 the Boston area depended upon my mother for doing their taxes and she was a no really she was a numbers yeah, she was person. Very good. So um, that's really what she did. She was literally yeah, she, the so woman behind. But when he died, she knew she had to do something for herself. So after a year, she applied and went to a master's. A, a master's program for education. And she finished that and then realized that she really didn't like kids, which we could have told her. Um, that it was, she didn't like to teach young kids. So at that point, there was an opportunity, and I think it was actually because of Joel, that um, yeah, she went true. to Sarah Lawrence. And, um, she left the house in Natick, and off she went, and she worked at Sarah Lawrence. And then it, there was the opportunity to do that at Brandeis. And so she was at Sarah Lawrence for about a year and a half, and then she started Creative Arts. Um, and that's, that's really where I think she got the idea that this was something that was a structured thing that she should be doing. I think she reached out to also Aaron a lot, and I think Aaron's, um, was very tuned in to what was going on in the Library of Congress and uh, Newsom and Betty. And I wish you'd help us out here, Betty. <laughs> but maybe, you know, what? We're, we're doing okay? Well, Thank you, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm failing a no, multiple so, choice No, 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 we're, doing, we're doing great. We're all, okay. we're all doing great. Okay. Um, the, the, the thing that comes out of this from the beginning is that it was all about the network. And I think what's happened since 1962 is that a network has grown actually pretty rapidly considering, I mean, there are a lot of his colleagues who are much more prolific in terms of compositional output because they lived longer, but they're not paid attention to much, and at least there's an effort behind fine. So nowadays, we're in a position where we have the Library of Congress, we have Brandeis University, we have the Irving Fine Society, we have Boozy and Hawks, who is one of our key partners, thank you, Trudy, uh, in promoting Fine's music. Uh, we have uh, folks who at, at Harvard who are turning around and becoming interested. Woo! Yay! N hasn't always been the case. Um, no offense to Harvard, but uh, I went to Brandeis, so. <laughs> um, and then what's been really special about the centennial year is that people have been coming out of the woodwork who we would have never expected to be, be interested in this. For example, we had uh, the Contemporary Music Center of Milan did an Irving Fine Centennial concert in Milan. And we had no clue about it until after it happened. We wish we could have been more involved in it, but it just happened and they wrote to us and they said, we love your father's music and we're doing this and thanks and keep up the good work. How about the Boston Conservatory? Yeah, Boston Conservatory I mean, just did blue, a huge, yeah. Yeah, out of the blue, I mean, I obviously have Google alerts <laughs> and whatever I can to find out what's going on. Out of the blue, my buddies from, who many of who are here today from the uh, the Chamber Music Conference of the East, which I attend each year, called me up and said, are you coming to Boston? There's an Irving Fine all his choral works, and um, I hadn't even heard of it, and sure enough, I went, my son Joseph came, and his friend Leah, and it was amazing, they sang all his choral works, and it was a fabulous concert, out of the blue. But one other thing in terms of network is, um, after he died, there was also a lot of publicity from the McDowell Colony, where there is a cabin in his name, and the honor of being in that cabin was sort of publicized more because of the, his loss. Secondly, he had relationships with both the Juilliard Quartet and also the New York Wooden Quintets. And even to this day, Bill Purvis, who didn't know my father, he's too young, um, of the New York he said to me, every concert, or almost every concert they were gonna give this year, as an encore, they were gonna play the gigue of the partita. Yeah, they always so the connections, first of all, and I feel like I'm my mother talking, 
<laughs> when I would, when she, when I would say, "Mom, I'm sorry, I can't go. You know, I'm on call. I can't keep you company. I would feel so bad." And she said, "Listen, it's okay because in the end, his music will survive because it's, it's beautiful and it's universal and it should. And I, yeah, I want you to work." And she expected our kids to carry it on. She said, "But the bottom line is, it has to carry on because of what it is." And in the end, that's really what's happened is that. Even these chamber music players and these orchestra players, they didn't remember my father very much, but they love the music and they feel connected to it, and I think that that's what's really carrying it on, and that's great. And uh, I think one of the things that was so smart about what your mom did was she forced the endowments as a term to have the stipulation about having concerts so that the music would be in people's face, and rather than just the money going off to do other things, like it's great that she did the professorship, and we appreciate Marty Boykin. Where are you, Marty? Having been no, that, a, that, a former fine that professor. Pro that professorship is actually through Charlotte oh, yeah. Yeah. and... Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it's not... Bra uh, Brandeis always needed uh, some... Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing with the music that I think is our takeaway from this and for the future is that we all need to continue to just get people to hear the music because as soon as they hear the piece that clicks and that works for them, they're hooked on Irving Fine and it doesn't go away. And it's not every piece for everyone. Um, there's all kinds of different styles. There's the early, very um, populist neoclassical works, the choral works, Alice in Wonderland, all the way through to the Choral New Yorker, which is this esoteric setting of actual poems that appeared in the New Yorker magazine, to the hourglass. And then the symphony is this gargantuan thing compared to something like uh, Bl the Blue and the White, which is the Brandeis fight song. So he had this versatility, which is amazing. And I still have yet to find someone who, after I play them, a little bit of each different genre that he composed and say that they don't like his music, or at least one piece. And that's, that's I think, the, the, the result of your family, Rosalie, Verna, and um, Irving's parents knowing that the music needed to be heard. And that's where, they, what, where the effort has been placed. And one last this. little quick comment. There are some pieces that are now such mainstays, I think, I believe. For example, the partita, the partita is as my colleague said, there literally is not a wind player who plays wooden quintets who has not played the partita. It is, it is the mainstay of wooden, wooden quintet literature. And honestly, the Alice in Wonderland choral music, when we were in high school, they did not know that Irving Fine's daughters were in their little chorus, but somehow that managed to be one of the songs that we, one of the pieces we that we did. And it's, um, and my kids all sang them. Um, in their high schools, you know, not because their mother was Irving Fine's daughter. So I think once you have that introduction to at least those two clearly mainstay pieces of literature, hopefully people will expand from there and listen to other music. And one of the things that we're, we're doing, we like with today's transcription of the Toccata Contratante, is trying to present these things in new ways that might reach different people. For example, the Library of Congress cannot present an orchestral concert with a 60 to 80 piece orchestra. We can't, but we can present to you the orchestral music in a different format, like we had the film of the symphony, we had David's transcription, and this is something that Irving was interested in too, and the prime example is his choral arrangements of Copland's Old American songs. There is no chorus in this country that has not at some point performed those arrangements, and um, on your way out at the end of the day here, check out the arrangement of Ching Ring Cha, Ching Ring Ching Ching, 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 ching Ho Ding a Ding Come Lucky, that's right. Irving, and that's Copland allowing Irving to become a part of his musical identity, which is really amazing. Uh, and it shows the depth of their relationship. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time for this panel, uh, but we ask you to just hold tight in your seats, and we're going to go to the last panel now. And please give a round of applause for Claudia, Emily, Joanna, and Rosalie. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.